On behalf of Provost Marilyn Hopkins, welcome to Turo University, California. My name is Jim Sotiros. I'm Associate Vice President for Advancement, and it's my, insere, my, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to Turo. Turo University is a private, nonprofit, Jewish sponsored institution with graduate programs in medicine, pharmacy, physician assistant studies, public health, and education. We are proud to be a part of the Vallejo community and pleased to host the Vallejo Business Partnership, which is comprised of the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce, the Solano Association of Realtors, and the Vallejo Business Alliance, and pleased to host this City Council Candidates Forum. Let me introduce the moderator for this evening, Mr. Michael Cohen, Chairman of the Board of the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Jim Soteras and Toro University for providing this great place for this uh, tonight's event. On behalf of the sponsors of tonight's event, the Chamber of Commerce, the Association of Realtors, and the Vallejo Business Alliance, I'd like to thank all of you candidates for taking the time to come and join us to speak on behalf of the citizens of Vallejo as to what is important to all of us. As many of you know, there are three seats open for this year's election for the City Council. Each carries a four-year term. And I'll go ahead and introduce the candidates. Uh, I do apologize in advance. We didn't have the name tags, which we thought we were going to have. So um, we'll, go on, we'll have to go on memory, and hopefully I'll do good on that. Um, I'd like to start by saying, uh, introducing Sam Kershon. <laughs> Jonathan Logan. <laughs> Jess Malgapo. See, I already, I already screwed up, I'm sorry. Aaron Hannigan. And I'm gonna apologize in advance. Matthias Asamui. Robert McConnell. And Bob Sampayan. After tonight's council um, question and answer session, there's gonna be a 15 minute break where we will break for uh, refreshments and then there will, we will have the mayor oral candidates come up on stage and we will start that at the end of this. There are pre-established guidelines that we have. The opening, everyone's gonna have a chance to give a one and a half minute opening statement. The questions will be, a, there'll be a minimum of 10 questions. Each question will be posed to a random person selected prior to this in the order they're sitting. Each person that the question is given will be given one minute to answer the question, and then each candidate will given, be given a 30-second rebuttal. Candidates were made aware of the general topics of this forum, but were not given the specific questions that will be asked tonight. In the front row is our timekeeper for tonight's event, the Vice Chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, Rudy Manfredi. Rudy, can you stand up? Rudy has... Uh, cards that will indicate where they have 10 seconds, and then a red card will indicate it's time to cut them off, and I will do my best to keep that fair to everyone. Tonight's forum is being recorded and broadcast by OzCat Radio and taped by digital format by the Vallejo Community Access Television, VCAT, and Channel 27. This event will be rebroadcast at various times throughout the next several weeks up until the election. On behalf of the voters, Vallejo voters, we thank VCAT and OZCAT for this coverage tonight to enable those that were not able to join us. I would ask that everyone please turn your cell phone to vibrate so that we don't have any interruptions. With that, we will begin. So the first question is for you, uh, Mr. Kershon. Factually, in Solano County, and more importantly, Vallejo, Commercial property is experiencing a greater devaluation than other Bay Area communities. What would you do to stimulate business and recruit new businesses to our city? Well, I have a plan. Is this on? It should be in. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, I have a plan where I'd like to see council district established for each council member. And... Uh, They'd be responsible for geographic area of the city, which would also 
have a community board established for it, and they would be members of the Chamber of Commerce, business owners, homeowners, school teachers, principals, police, everyone, clergy in that community. They'd meet once a month, and they would decide what the needs were for that community. And then at the end of that month, they'd meet with the full Chamber of Commerce and the City Council and the new Economic Development Department and solicit businesses based on that. I also see Mare Island as the main draw for new business out here. I believe that we should establish a light rail system that comes out here. And uh, in light of what the President's going to say this evening, I think the money is available to do this in a concerted effort with the federal government, the state, the county, and also private industry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Logan. I think it would be important for the uh, city, uh, city council to create the business environment that's business friendly and that's attractive to uh, potential businesses that would want to move to town and also uh, to uh, re-engage the communities, uh, businesses that currently exist. And so I, I, I would say that we would, we have to have some investment uh, to make that happen. Uh, investment in our schools, investment in our roads and public infrastructure. Uh, this is a way we'll attract uh, businesses. They have a lot of opportunities. Thank you. Councilman Hannigan. Can I just say, I thought we had a 90 second opening. Oh, you did, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I guess we'll have a 90 second closing. You, you will get an opportunity to close. Just details. Um, stimulating business in our community. It's a, first of all, I think all of us should shop here in Vallejo first. This should be the first location that we think about when we're going out to make our purchases. Every tax dollar that you spend in our community is going to stay in our community. And we're only going to stimulate our economy if we, as concerned citizens of the city of Vallejo, do that first. I'd like to create a local bidder preference for both the city, for both sand and flood, two um, entities that we as a council have oversight. Um, improving our permitting process, we're already in the process of that. Let's continue to support it, support current businesses, and, and work to attract future businesses through incentives and providing um, support for them to get here. Thank you. Cheaply, thank you. Mr. Asomi? Yeah, what I believe um, the city people should do to encourage business in the city of Vallejo is to increase initiative that we develop jobs for every common man in the city. We should have a, an idea of visions that will produce jobs, have initiative that can lead for creating jobs. If any man said he can create a job, it's not possible. You can only have initiative to create a job. We have a lot of homeless. You have people who have no job. Thank you. Mr. Magapa. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yes, I think the first thing we need to do is to uh, uh, encourage and keep the businesses that are already here. The, uh, the next step would be to encourage new business to come to our city. Uh, sometimes we take a passive stand where we would uh, take no uh, Maryland, for example, where we would uh, seek out potential investors by submitting RFPs, and now we're doing RFQs. Uh, uh, but we sort of kind of wait for them to show up. What do you have? What are your plans? Thank you. I Mr. McConnell? We need to not only stimulate new business, but we need to focus on retaining our present business through a more friendly atmosphere at, at City Hall, and also a coordinated program between the Chamber of Commerce and our educational institutions to help people who are, start to get into trouble with their business so that they can learn about budgeting, financing, legal considerations. For new business, I believe we should look at a, at a business incubator where we create a building and a alliance between the city council and also our educational institutions to train people in new business at a subsidized rate until they can begin to function on their own. Thank you. Mr. Sampine. Thank you. One of the very first things that we need to do is promote Vallejo as a positive city, and we need to challenge the negative things that have plagued us. The second thing we need to do is encourage to shop Vallejo. Shop Vallejo first so we can keep our tax dollars here in our community. So one of the third things we need to do is follow the RFQ proposal that our economic development director has proposed. So we'll see who's qualified to build. So we'll know that these people are ready to go within our community and they're not pulling the wool over our eyes with RFPs. 
Another thing that we need to do is advocate for more improved customer service and friendly business policies. Thank you. With, thank you. Next question for you, Mr. Logan. What is your plan for development of Mare Island as a whole, and more particularly the north end of the island? What would you do to retain the current businesses and attract new businesses to Mare Island? Um, number one, Mare Island, uh, in order to build there, especially on the North Island, it's going to require a lot of money, a lot of investment. Uh, so we have to make sure that whoever we bring in, uh, they have the, the resources to do that. Uh, my, the plan that's currently in place uh, with the Economic Development Department issuing an RFQ makes a lot of sense. It gives us an opportunity to evaluate uh, the, the business and their, their qualifications opposed to their grandiose vision for what could happen there. Uh, again, Mare Island has to be clean. Uh, unless it's clean, then uh, the state won't allow us to do anything there. And so there are things underway now to ensure that it's, it's uh, clean, but it's not there yet. Uh, one thing that I would propose doing is creating a, a, a city-led body uh, that could support Lenar Mare Island in terms of working with the state, uh, I'm sorry, the federal government to get it clean, and then also working with the state to ensure that uh, that they don't have a whole lot of issues with uh, regulations. Thank you. Councilman Hangood. Thank you. Um, I totally support the RFQ process that we have put forward for the North End of Mare Island. Again, that's going to show who's got the money to be able to do what it is we need to do. The plan for the island was for it to always be a job center. And uh, I think we've been very lucky in that we, ha we are seeing over 2,000 jobs currently on the island and over 90 companies have located here. We need to support those companies. It's an industrial use. It's a billion dollar investment by the, by the government to our community. Let's use it for what it is. We've got a rail that's opened up and a port, and we just need to continue to support those businesses. Thank you. Mr. SMA? We need to support business in Mayor Land for many reasons. For economic development, it's a big place, <clears throat> almost three miles square. If we have good initiative by supporting <laughs> The, those companies who want to bring jobs to May Island, we need to give them tax incentive. By giving them tax incentive, they can create jobs. Not only tax incentive, at least 80 percent of the workers employed in, this, in the, the company should be from Vallejo. You're Thank creating you. jobs. Thank you. Mr. Magapa. Uh, Yes, there's a lot going on at Mayor Island, not necessarily visible to all of us. Lenar did, in fact. Uh, made significant progress. There are many businesses already on the island, but the north end itself, which is 157 acres, it's clean, it's been uh, certified, ready to go, but we failed, we had two failed attempts, one with the Cancer Research Center, the second one was the uh, Mare Island Studios. We need somebody big, somebody stable. It's gonna cost $8 million just to demolish everything Thank and you. prepare the area. Mr. McConnell. Yes, a recent economic study indicated that more and more retail shoppers are beginning to shop at factory outlets. Having spent eight years on the Planning Commission, I'm fairly familiar with the requirements of each portion of this island, and the North End does present unique items, but a, a tax base out there with retail establishments producing not only property tax and sales tax and opportunities for jobs would greatly enhance our, our ability to compete on a global area. The south end, we can attempt to hook not only Toro, but the California Maritime Academy with research and development in maritime industry as well as in health-related industries. Thank you. Mr. Sampine. Thank you. We have to respect the fact that Mare Island is a beautiful and historic island. We have to retain that ambiance for the island. We cannot settle for the first thing that comes along. We have to advocate for mixed use of the island in the industrial areas. We should utilize light rail for shipping and receiving, and we should also look at the, uh, the open dock space that is available for intercoastal water transfers. We need to look at companies that will recycle some of the old materials that are in the old buildings in North Vallejo. Thank you. Mr. Kershon. Well, in order to have jobs on Mare Island, first you have to be able to get out here. So. Um, I think public transportation needs to be established immediately where the city has a bus line come out here. 
And in the long term, the light rail system would be the wonderful alternative, not only in its construction phase, but afterwards the maintenance facility and the train yard could be here. This train would also go up towards Napa and the rest of the county. There are tracks that go east and west. It's unlimited what it could do. Also, the marine industrial reuse Thank and you. the casino in Area 1A. Thank you. Next question, Councilmember Hennigan. How do you plan to improve communications and work with the Vallejo City Unified School District? Please be specific. Well, I actually am working with the Vallejo Unified School District. Um, I spent a year and a half with the Career Academy Master Plan, putting together uh, with a team of, of uh, educators and business leaders in our community, putting together a plan for uh, supporting the career academies that we currently have in our high schools and adding more, and looking to that as really being the avenue for getting our students educated and interested in school. It, it's really proven that career academies can lower um, the dropout rate, and currently that's at 40 percent. The other uh, project I'm involved with is, is with the Vallejo Business Education Alliance. And again, that's a, a group of um, leaders here in the community that includes the president of Turo, CMA, Solana Community College, as well as business and educators. And within that group, we are looking to ways to support our students here in our community so we can raise our test scores, so we can prepare our children for the future. Because really, at the end of the day, these are our kids. These aren't everybody else's kids. These are our kids. And we need to make sure that our kids get an excellent on education because when you talk about economic development, it's not going to happen if we don't have the schools to support it. Thank you. Mr. Asami? To have the education, the communication with the school board or the school uh, authority, there's a lot of things we should look into. Belong, being, and we should not forget becoming. If you have those things in our ideas, we know our school system before produce a curriculum for a school. The family need to be aware of the type of curriculum you are preparing for the school. How will it affect the children? Because if you go to the school, most of them, the way they dress, we need a dress code. It's very important. Thank Where you. children can dress very politely. Thank you. Mr. Magapo. Uh, just as our city is on the verge of, uh, or have exited uh, chapter nine, the school district is on the verge of getting out of receivership. They have strong leadership with uh, Ms. Bishop, we have two strong principals in our high schools. Certainly the city could forge a better, stronger partnership with our schools so that when the parents have their kids reach seventh grade, they're not thinking about leaving our city and moving out. There's certainly a lot we can do. People will say, well, the council don't have jurisdiction over the schools. That's not exactly true because there's a lot the council can do to work with our city, Thank improving you. our education. And, and security in our school, school grounds. Thank you. Mr. McConnell? Yes, to enhance communication between the city and the school district, the council should create a full-time liaison officer. We have a liaison officer for every one of our commissions. We don't have one for the school district, and that needs to change. There needs to be a different attitude in City Hall about cooperation between the school district and the city so that when the school district and schools want to obtain cooperation from the city, they're not told they have to pay a $1,500 fee to open up the streets for a walk from their old school to the new one. Thank until you. Until that attitude changes, our communication will not improve. Mr. Sampayan. Thank you very much. We have to partner with the school district and collaborate with some long-range planning to bring about positive change. We have to work together to reduce truancy and keep our children in school. They are our future. These long-range strategies have to include things like a plan by the U.S. government, Department of Labor, and President Obama. It is called the Promise Neighborhood Plan. This will keep young people in school. This keeps them and tracks them through from cradle to college to career. Thank it's you. Mr. Kershaw? The school system needs uh, financial resources in order to thrive and the continued partnering of private industry with the schools, whether it be on a local level with small businesses or with big corporations, need to be continued to fund the career academies that exist. Not every student is college bound, and these academies give students an interest in something that they'll pursue up to the career level. I think that's a direction to keep going in, 
And I'd also like to explore the legality of fining parents of perpetual truants. Thank you. Mr. Logan. Uh, I would say that my plan is uh, PPI, partner, promote, and inspire. Uh, we would partner with the school district. This is something I have experience with. Uh, currently, I manage a recreation district, and we partner all the time with the school on different programs. Uh, when the school lost their art program as a rec district, this is what we did. This is what we provided for the uh, student body there. Uh, when I talk about promote, we need to talk about our schools for the good things that they have. Uh, the perception is that the school district isn't good. The 40% dropout rate is what people talk about, uh, but we have excellent students, and uh, those are the things that we should promote. Thank you. Next question for you, Mr. SMA. What is your position on Measure B, the 1% sales tax, on the November ballot? If it passes, how will you ensure the money is spent more efficiently and most effectively? I support Measure B because when you increase tax, more money to the city. We can help the police. You can help the educational institution. More people will be hired. More infrastructure will be in place. Because when there's an increase and more money comes to the city, more road will be built. Take an example where there's a lot of infrastructure empty. There may, might be some initiative to give to people, maybe to have rented for their homes. With that increase in the uh, 1% tax, you have a lot of things you can do with the money. You, you can, <clears throat> like children drop out in the school, give them training initiative. Those who have no their GD, GED, let them have a GED. Those who have no training, let them have training. When they have training, they can become a citizen. And crime will be reduced in the city. We have less work to do. We have less moving around. Crime running here and running there. It will reduce because job is already there for them. Thank you. Mr. Mogapo? Uh, yes, I support Measure B. We, uh, uh, for the first time in uh, uh, three years, we have a budget that is uh, sound, uh, but there's not a lot of room to, to do with this budget. Anything happens to revenue where it slides to the left, then that budget execution is in peril and we're back into dangerous grounds. Uh, in, in 2008, our budget was uh, 76 million. Today, our budget has dropped to 65 million. Thank that you. Mr. McConnell? I'm against Measure B. I think it's the wrong answer at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. For those of you who live in this town, you, it will also be a use tax, which means if you purchase something over the internet, the Board of Equalization will, will be sending you a survey, just like they send my business, to find out whether or not you owe additional monies. If it does pass, then I would be lobbying very, very hardly, hard in favor of economic development people with the city or partnered with a chamber of commerce or a private institution. Fairfield has four full-time economic developers. We have one. Thank you. Mr. Sampayan. I'm against Measure B. The reason why is because it has no spending plan. It's the same old way of doing business. Right now, we need to cut costs, not staff, not services. Nearly 80% of our city budget goes towards salaries. That leaves 20% for city services. With that 20%, we can do very little to keep our city going. Vacaville has 36 more sworn and non-sworn people, and they pay $4 million less in their police department. They have three more firefighters than we have, and they pay $1.8 million less. Total savings per year, $5.8 million. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw. Whatever is, was, and should be, the reality of the situation is we don't have the revenue to hire more firefighters and police. And nobody likes taxes, but the reality again is that if we don't have this tax passed, we're not going to be able to afford on the short term to hire these people. And without the place being safe and perceived the way it is, this city is not going to draw people to do business here and bring in new revenue. Thank you. Mr. Logan. All right. I live here on Merrill Island. I pay property taxes. I also pay a special tax, uh, Melrose tax, uh, to live here. And I consider my tax in this community an investment. 
Uh, but I do also want to know that it's going to be spent correctly like most of you. Uh, so on my website, I want you to visit. I'll have a plan up tonight that spells out because 30 seconds is enough time uh, to talk about how it works. But I consider it an investment. We have to put it in the roads. We have to get more cops and firemen on the street. We have to get some money into youth development. We have to get some money into economic development. If we have grandiose plans, the question is how do we, uh, how do we finance them? And Thank that's you. what I think the tax could be used for. Thank you. Councilman Hannigan. Yeah, I support Measure B. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that our community needs that we are not going to have the money for for probably close to six or seven years. We have a very flat budget that um, is projected for the next five years. It's stable um, and sustainable, but of course, any blip can, can um, throw it off course. One of the things that our city does is strictly does provide services, and it takes people to do that, and that does cost, cost money. I'd question those who are not in support of it, who are, who are projecting this $5.8 million in savings in public public safety. Ask how they plan to do that, because I don't see where it is. Our budget projections are very tight, and they do... Thank you. Okay, next question for you, Mr. Magapo. <clears throat> if it is, was entirely up to you, how would you solve the public safety funding issues in Vallejo and rectify the issue that the public at large in Vallejo does not feel safe? Please be specific. Without Measure B, it's going to be very, very tough. Uh, but we need to do more partnerships. Uh, I'll cite one example. Kaiser Permanente gave us uh, $750,000, which allowed us to hire three officers for three years. And through a safer grant, the federal government gave us $3.2 million, which allowed us to hire nine firefighters and reopen one uh, fire station. We need to do more of these. There's money out there. We just got to go out and find it and keep our city safe. But without Measure B, we're in for a long road to, to recovery. Uh, the services are not even substandard. They are unacceptable. We need to pass Measure B. Thank you. Mr. McConnell? If it was up to me, I would restructure pension plans. I would reorganize how we deliver services. I would look at ways of reducing cost for capital uh, expenditures, such as vehicles. I would have people who can do th scientific things, investigate crimes, rather than having a police officer with a badge and a gun who can take away your liberty and kill you only. And I would encourage more citizens' involvement, such as has occurred with the neighborhood watch groups, because that will be the future of our town. Thank you. Mr. Sampayan. We need to explore alternatives to our current staffing levels. We need to use civilians to augment patrol, such as CSOs, community service officers. They can take the paper calls, the non-emergency calls, accidents. They can assist in follow-ups. They can also do the CSI type work. We can also use uh, reserve police officers. They're non-sworn, they're non-paid volunteers who can do the prisoner transport. They can back up the regular officers. They'll augment patrol by driving around in marked police units. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw. It's important to know how we got to where we are, but all of these solutions are long term. In my opinion, I think that we should use the entire measure B tax to pay for public safety, as controversial and as unpopular as that may be, and to give us a financial cushion until we earn some revenue. I think we should ask the police and firefighters not to take any raises at all in the first year of their next contracts. Thank you. Mr. Logan. Uh, I would say um, we all need to be aware of what restructuring a pension really means. Uh, it means nothing for the current staff that we have right now. Uh, state law determines that what the pension plan is for existing employees is what it will be moving forward and until they retire. So unless there's a change in state law, that's not going to happen. Uh, but I do want to say, not for current employees, it would only impact new hires. Uh, but I do want to say we, we need to be smart about crime. Uh, number one, crime doesn't happen all through the city, and so we need to figure out where crime is happening, deploy police officers to that area so that we keep it safe. Thank you. Councilmember Hannigan. Thank you. During my four years, um, We've, I've, reduced, I've worked to reduce the cost of our public safety services through negotiated contracts that include two-tiered retirement plans and reductions in health and um, retirement benefits. 
uh, what I'd like to do moving forward as we start increasing our services is to look into use, to continue to utilize community volunteers and also capitalize on the technology that we have in place, such as the cameras. I think that's a very important um, development as far as how we're going to police in the future. I'd like to consolidate with like agencies as well. Thank you. Mr. SMA. Safety of our city is very paramount. It's the work of every individual. Not only that, my years in the military, 18 years, is not a joke. I know what it's planned to be in the safe environment. We need to build relationship between the police and individuals of the city. We need to have cordial relationship that we energize everyone to know any crime in the city can relate to death or one thing or the other. Thank you. Next question for you, Mr. McConnell. What is your position on the influx of medical marijuana dispensaries in Vallejo, and how would you regulate them, and should they be taxed? I'm in, measure, I'm in favor of Measure C. At this point, I would not adopt a regulatory scheme because yesterday the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of California, a court in which I work, wrote to the city of Eureka and admonished them not to adopt a regulatory statute or they would be exposing themselves as counselors to individual liability. So we, ha we need to work more closely with the federal government. In the area of law I work in, I constantly go between federal law and state law. That means we have to negotiate with the federal government. We have to go to, lobby, to Washington to lobby. We need to strengthen, really strengthen, our state statute in this area. And until that is done, I don't think we can adopt a regulatory uh, ordinance in this town. About the only thing we can do is really adopt a moratorium until we can determine what can be done. Thank you. Mr. Sampaio? I support Measure C. In particular, that what we need to do is tax the MMDs because what they have done to our community is brought about an image that Vallejo does not need. With Measure C, we will have the availability to regulate the MMDs, where they're going to go, where they're going to be placed. Do we want them in our neighborhoods? Do we want them in our downtown that we're trying to revitalize? With this regulatory process, we'll be able to look forward to cleaning up our downtown, to have it revitalized, to bring back the businesses that we want. Right now, folks that go into the downtown area look at that as something negative. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw. Thank you. Well, we put the cart before the horse once again, but nevertheless, I'm for Measure C. I think they should be taxed and heavily. But what we need to do first is write an ordinance, a sound ordinance governing when and where they can operate, having no more than four or five in the entire city. <coughs> and I think we should close every single one of them down, including the one that's licensed, until this is resolved, including what our legal liability might be if the federal government steps in and arrests everybody. Thank you. Mr. Logan. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot that's been said. Uh, we do have to clear up the discrepancies between the state and federal law uh, before we look to regulate. Uh, but at, after we have some idea of what that looks like, we, we need to regulate, and I do support the, uh, the tax. Uh, and the way I would regulate it is to issue out a certain number of permits, uh, and the permits will be available to potential business owners, and that way we don't have uh, shops sprouting up everywhere. Uh, and then I would also make sure that our zoning was appropriate so that the shops weren't being uh, started near schools and churches and other uh, venues. Thank you. Councilman Hannigan. I support Measure C. I also support regulation of the shops, the numbers of them, the locations where they are. I don't think, yeah, I, I don't know what that number is. I think it's less than five for sure. But one of the things that, that hasn't been mentioned up here is holding property owners accountable for housing a medical marijuana dispensary in their building. We as a city need to be more responsible. At, to, we need to hold our property owners responsible for making sure that the businesses they have in their properties are legal. And we're not doing that. And I've been asking the city attorney's office for that, and it just goes, phew. But we need to start holding them accountable, finding them until they get those businesses out. It's not about the business. It's about the property Thank owner. Thank you. Mr. Asamemi? I am against marijuana in the city, totally. There's more harm than good it does. Because if you look at it, a lot of people that take drug has more effect on their body compared with those that do not take drug. And 
having marijuana is of a dangerous situation to the family, to the children, to the father. That marijuana have ruined homes, a lot of homes. Those, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Magapo. I support Measure C because it will generate revenue. As far as uh, MMDs, uh, if it's truly medicinal, I think it ought to be dispensed in uh, pharmacies and hospitals and not out there on the streets uh, of downtown Vallejo. I've spoken with merchants out there. They're terrified. They're uh, outraged because while their customers are shopping, they can smell marijuana. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. The people that buy. Thank you. Next question for you, Mr. Sampayan. The current Callahan de Silva waterfront plan to develop the open space is still in its planning stages and has been for several years. What is your position on this plan and how would you and when would you move forward with this plan? The entire waterfront has, has been an issue for this community for quite a few years. There are folks that would like to see it developed. There's those that would not. I would like to see quality development in our waterfront or on our waterfront. I would like to see shops. I would like to see a promenade. I would like to see folks entertained down in the waterfront. It is a beautiful area where people can come to relax, enjoy, and see the sights of our, our town. It's also close to the ferry system where visitors that come into our community from the San Francisco area are first arriving. They'll be able to see that we care about our community and it gives that first initial visual impact that people can see that a town really cares. The beauty of a development in the downtown area, again, would attract businesses. It would also assist in the development of Mare Island and it would also enhance the downtown area in its revitalization. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw? Well, I think we should uh, use backward development with this. I'm all for it, but we need to put the commercial services in place first before any housing. We need to have the stores, the restaurants, the small businesses like dry cleaners, for example, first. Then we need to adhere strictly to the plan not build the buildings too tall or too uncomplimentary to the waterfront. Not block out light and, thir and, and shadows either. Make them a compliment. Thank you. Mr. Logan. I'm not familiar enough with the specific plan, but what I will say is that I think the waterfront is an untapped uh, asset here in our community. Uh, some development could definitely happen there. Uh, that would make sense. I think also it and I've heard this before, it will uh, increase activity in our downtown area. When people come to the waterfront as a destination, then they'll trickle into the uh, downtown area. <coughs> this is what economic development is about. It's not about a parcel here and a parcel there, but it's looking at the, uh, the city as a whole and figuring out how do we attract folks and give them an opportunity to do their uh, business here in the city. Thank you. Councilman Hannigan. Yeah, I support the waterfront redevelopment plan, and I have from the beginning. Um, not only is it in the planning, but it's also in the development stages at this point. Ca the Capitol Street and Georgia Street extensions have been opened. And more importantly, the construction of the ferry parking has begun and is almost finished for one half of it. Um, that is an important piece of the entire project to get those cars off of the uh, parking uh, lots and then putting them, um, stacking them up so we can go through all the things that we've talked about up here and that is the retail and, and, the, um, and the restaurants and it's really going to take us to go downtown and shop downtown in order to get downtown going. Thank Not you. development, us. Mr. Estimemi. I support uh, waterfront development. One, first impression matters for people coming from San Francisco. When they see the place more beautiful, they would love to come next time. We need a good shop so that they will not walk a long distance going to maybe America, Kenya, or somewhere else to buy something. Let's beautify the place, make it more attractive. When people come from anywhere, they will love to be there again second time. Thank you. Mr. Magapa? Uh, yes, uh, developing the waterfront is going to be key to our economic recovery. Uh, so I support significant development there, but if it was up to me personally, what I'd like to see there is something similar to Pier 39 in San Francisco, where it's flourishing with businesses. People say where there's water, there's life. 
Well, yes, there's life on the east side of the Mare Island Straits, uh, where we have the front room restaurant, Ciofredos, and so forth. There's not much going on on the west side of Mare Island Straits, but that entire waterfront could be something similar to Pier 39, then, then that makes Vallejo a tourist destination. We have Th an amusement park. Thank you. Mr. McConnell? As I sat on the Planning Commission when we reviewed the specific plan for the waterfront development of Callahan da Silva, and it now needs to be revisited, updated, and changed. The reason for that is the plan itself and the development projects depend very, very heavily upon massed housing along the waterway, not on the water, but back from it. Our housing market has now changed. It's not coming back for many years, so we need to rework the plan. The, ha the specific plan also called for housing over on parcel 1A, which is that lot that leads in to, to uh, the sardine can. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw, next question. If it was entirely up to you, which would you choose for Vallejo, a strong mayor form of government or a city manager form of government, and how would you implement this task? Hmm. <laughs> wow. I'd have a strong mayor government, and I would leave that up to the voters to ultimately decide by making a ballot issue, and if it was approved, then the charter and the laws and things that pertain to it would follow. Thank you. Uh, can you repeat the question one more sure. time? Sure. If it was entirely up to you, which would you choose for Vallejo? A strong mayor or city manager form of governance, and how would you implement this task? It, it depends on the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I'm familiar with the, uh, the system that we have now, and I actually think it works well to have a, uh, a manager in place. Uh, I'm not opposed to the strong mayor. Uh, concept, uh, it would be something that the voters would definitely have to agree to uh, because it's in our charter now and so it would have to be uh, removed. Thank you. Councilman Hagan. I, gosh, I really haven't thought about that question, but um, we haven't done it well with our city manager form of government. We've had 17 city managers in the last 25 years. So, you know, maybe we try something different. Um, I think my concern about the mayor being a part-time mayor is they're actually required to do a full-time job. And if you, you're not going to be able to raise your family and support your lifestyle on a mayor's salary, I can tell you that. You're going to have to have a full-time job in order to do both. If, if, if we're going to be able to get a variety of mayor, of mayor candidates in the future. So I, I, I do, I think that question needs a lot more exploration. Thank you. Mr. Assembly? I feel the mayor is the administrator of the city. He is the head. Um, I think I support the mayor because you need to have a new design, a new vision that compare with the city manager because the city manager might have your own agenda. So the mayor, he's there to work for the people, not like the city manager who think maybe it's not of his own personal interest. Thank you. Mr. Mokapa? Well, I, I had this conversation with two former mayors of our city, and uh, they do not believe that a uh, strong mayor form of government will ever pass in the city of Vallejo. So that leaves us with the city manager uh, version, uh, which is fine, except for the last uh, five, six, seven city managers, they seem to all carry the title interim. Uh, I brought that uh, subject matter as well, but the, the issue became the salary. Uh, interim city managers are the one. Thank you. Mr. McConnell. I sat on the most recent charter review committee. Fourteen of us studied that issue very carefully, and we concluded as a group that we should not have a strong mayor in the city of Vallejo. The reason for that is that we did not feel we had the available resources from which to select out of a qualified pool of applicants, a sustainable city, city uh, mayor for a long-term basis. My undergraduate and graduate works in public administration. I actually started out to be in city management when the Army decided they needed me more. And city managers can work when you select the right one, and that's what this next council is going to have to do. Thank you. Mr. Sempion. I believe that we should have a city manager form of government, and it's up to the voters to decide as to where, whether or not we're going to change that process. This program has worked, this process has worked for us for years. Yes, we've had numerous city managers. However, I would agree that they have been interim city managers. 
It's going to be up to this next city council to select one that is going to fulfill its obligation to this city, work for this community, listen to the people, and be a part of what this community is all about. I truly believe that this is the way that we're going to go in the future. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Logan. As an elected official in the city of Vallejo, what would you do to keep the families from leaving our community? How would you accomplish this task? Um, <clears throat> again, I live here on Mare Island. I bought a home about two years ago. Um, I decided that I wanted to live here. I wasn't forced to live here. It was a choice, uh, partly because I know all the benefits and the great things that exist here in the city of Vallejo. As an elected official, that would be my uh, one of my number one jobs is to make sure that other families, uh, young families, uh, middle class, upper class, whatever, uh, they knew how great Vallejo is, and uh, I would encourage them to, to move to the city. Uh, it's also important that we do things here that make our city friendly for new homeowners. Uh, we have to make sure streets are taken care of. We have to make sure that we don't have uh, news flashes about crime being on the rise here in the community. Uh, so if we, if we do those things, that, that would make it more conducive for a family to move here into the city. Thank you. Council Member Hannigan? Well, much like a company moving to the community, a, a family has to make the same decisions, and that is based on two factors, and that is, is it safe, and how's the education? And then at some point you talk about, is it affordable? Uh, we're definitely affordable, but I don't know that we're safe for families or we're providing the best education that we can for families. It doesn't mean that I don't think we can. I think we can. We have excellent people working on that right now, but we have to believe in our, in our public schools in order for us to be able to provide an excellent education. We offer a diverse community. We offer an excellent location as far as jobs, access to jobs, and we have wonderful access to open space. Thank this you. is a great community for families. Thank you. For a family to live in a city, there's three qualities you need to face. Being, belonging, and becoming. Which one are you? Ask yourself. Cheap houses, good environment, conducive of environment, and schools. Because nobody will move to an environment when the school is not there, quality of school is not there. And nobody will live in a city when there's a lot of crime. That's the most important thing for a lot of family. And when they're home and there's job, if the city have job opportunity, people would love to move to the city. Thank you. Mr. Magapa. The uh, state of our school systems is directly related to the state of our economy. Uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, I've talked to many parents that are already thinking about leaving our city by the time their kids are in seventh grade. That is very sad, that needs to stop, that exodus need to stop. We need to work with our schools, and this is why I'm saying we need to pass Measure B. We need a shot in the arm to get our econ economy going so we could do things, we could afford things. Thank you. Mr. McConnell? Since this housing crisis started, I have counseled hundreds and hundreds of families who have had to lose their home and when faced with the decision of where they move and why they move, they uniformly tell me that they will not put their children back in that school district. And the number one reason is their concern for the child's safety. So we are losing our middle class, we are losing our, our families. In order to change that, there has to be a change in the mentality of the city council, and that means working very, very closely and in high support of the school district and the new superintendent. Thank you. Mr. Sampayan? Our primary focus should be on education. We need to improve our education. Families that come to Vallejo, if we want to attract families, young families, the first thing they're going to look at is what is the education like here in town. If we can't provide a quality educational system for them, they'll move to other communities like Benicia, Fairfield, or Vacaville. We need to show that we're financially stable. We need to be able to market Vallejo as a city that is vibrant, that has great community spirit and is there for its residents. We need to show that we have public safety and that public safety is paramount for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw? We have to change our image, make the city a safe city, and make the schools, schools that parents want to enroll their children in. 
money is what we need to do that. The short term would be to pass the tax. The long term would be to restructure the way the schools are governed and have more input from the city council, the chamber of commerce, and people in the communities the schools are located in. Thank you. Next question, Council Member Hannigan. There's been a public outcry and concerns about public employees' unfunded pension liabilities and health care benefits in the city of Vallejo. What solution would you suggest to meet these obligations and how? That's a good question. Um, that's a good question for me. I've actually been working on this for the last four years. When we filed for bankruptcy, um, it also included renegotiating all of the contracts within the city of Vallejo. And as we moved through the contracts, our negotiations and, and the concessions that we were able to receive from the unions got better and better because what was happening, the environment around us was changing. You know, we compete as an employer, the city of Vallejo, with other cities who pay police services, who pay city for city employee services. And that competition is very similar to the, similar, to the same competition that you have for your own salaries and your own jobs. Um, they, they look at what does an average police officer pay, what are the benefits that are provided, um, what, how, you know, what, are, what are the conditions that they work under, and based on that information, outspits a range. Um, I think as, as a community, as a nation, we're, at, we're, we're looking at our pension plans. Um, these are pension plans I didn't put in place. They're only ones that I'm going to be um, improving upon. Thank and you. I, Mr. Asami? On the pension plan, what I believe is if you have 1% increase in tasks, we can meet a lot of different things we want to do for the retirees, even for health. We can afford 401k and uh, the insurance the government is proposing, which we benefit to the common people who have no insurance. It's very, very important. We don't want people to die in their home without insurance. If they die, there's no benefit, there's no gain for them, and there's, they don't even have any to rely upon. Thank but you. If it, Mr. Magapa. Right, I, I, uh, I will have to look at the, uh, the plan, and uh, it, it would be difficult to make a decision without having the facts in front of you. Uh, I, do, I do know this. We've given them some deep cuts from 127 officers to 95. Uh, from uh, maybe an equal number with fire, uh, cutting them about 47%, and this is why you're seeing the substandard uh, services. They've made a lot of concessions. Thank you. Mr. McConnell? There are 300 pension plans in the state of California. 89 of them control 90% of the employees in this state. This city has decided to go with PERS. However, the formula that is devised as to what goes into the computation for that retirement benefit is made at the local level. That's a political decision. When we decided to raise our police uh, salary 6.9 percent last year and a yet to be determined equal amount this year, we never ever addressed the question of pension plans. It could not have been addressed in the chapter 9. It requires political will to do that and I have that political will. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sampion. The bottom line is our retirement system is unsustainable. This city cannot afford to pay this kind of money to retirees. Does a private industry do the same thing for its retirees? Do they get the paid medical? Do they get to retire at 50 years old with 95% of their salary? I'd say no. We need to look nationally, statewide, to change the laws, to bring about restructuring of our, our retirement system for all our employees. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Kershaw. We should have people pay into the plan based on a couple of factors. One, how much money they make would depend on what they contribute. The ones that make more would contribute more. We should also have them contribute based on seniority, who's there longer or not who's there longer should contribute more. Thank you. Mr. Logan? I'm a public administrator now. I currently run a public agency. 
Uh, and just like the city of Vallejo, we had to deal with tax revenue loss, uh, a loss of tax revenue. Uh, so I'm familiar with this subject matter. Uh, it was something that I had to work out with my employees. I didn't have uh, 415 employees like the city of Vallejo. Uh, I had way less, so I knew them all by name. I knew the impacts that certain decisions would make on their family. Uh, but at the end of the day, we negotiated. We came out with a set up uh, or with an agreement that made sense for both the agency and the employee. That's what I will work to do. One thank more thing, unfunded, thank you. unfunded liabilities aren't new. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Next question from Mr. Esomemi. What is your position on the Solano 360 project at the fairgrounds and or what would you suggest as an alternative to the 360 plan? Could you repeat again, please? Sure. What is your position on the Solano 360 project at the fairgrounds and as an alternative, what would you suggest to the 360 plan? I'm not familiar with that very one, of course, uh, because I'm not used to the city city plan. But what I believe is, if there's a development in that area, it will attract more people. Because it's a big place. Wealth can be used for various things. Thank you. Mr. Magapa? I favor the uh, 360 plan. It's uh, a good mix of entertainment and uh, businesses. Uh, I just wish it would happen sooner. Uh, I watched the council proceedings when we authorized $2 million, or when the county authorized $2 million to, to pay Broad Street for the visioning and enti entitlement phase of the 360 plan, but it's just in slow motion, it seems to me. But I like the entertainment part of it. Uh, it's right next to an amusement park. That makes Vallejo a tourist destination, and that will make those tourists pay taxes when they come to our city. Thank you. Mr. McConnell. The, the, three, the 360 plan is not yet finalized. One of the biggest stumbling blocks is the division of the sales tax between the county and the city. Currently, our upper county supervisors desire to have a 75-25% split between county and city. I'm against that. However, <laughs> as to what should be developed out there, I'd love to see a convention center. We need one as an alternative. Kaufman Broad settled, entered into a district a resolution yesterday with the school board to return the land out on Rollingwood. That is an ideal place for a commercial center, including a grocery store so badly needed in, Thank South, you. in South Loyal. Mr. Sampayan. I'm in full agreement with the Solano 360 plan. The initial plan looked very exciting, but unfortunately it had to be cut down. What it, I can see it doing is enhancing the area up in North Vallejo that's going to bring about a mix of entertainment and business. Right now, we don't have a lot of business because of our, our economy, but what will go there soon is going to be a good mix of added entertainment and hopefully some type of convention center that is going to be available for our community. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw. I'm for the plan, but it needs severe modification to take into account a few things. I agree with Mr. McConnell. I think the city's getting crumbs off of this deal. I don't like the way the county acts like they're doing the city a favor here. I think the city needs to have an awful lot more say in how this is going down. I also think the kind of businesses that are going to be there shouldn't be the kind that are going to compete with the shopping center on the other side of 80, or else you're going to have a ghost town on both sides. Thank you. Mr. Logan? I'm in, I'm in favor of the plan, but I think there's some issues with it. Uh, a couple major things is uh, the redevelopment agencies or redevelopment agencies around the state, they're going away. Uh, and that project will rely heavily on uh, public investment and not only redevelopment uh, funding, but also state funding and federal funding. We all know what's going on uh, at the federal and state level. If that funding's not there, then we don't have a complete project. So I think we need to look at some of the attributes that make sense in this environment and uh, move forward on the project. Thank you. Councilman Hannigan. I support the uh, process of the project for the Solano 360. Um, I believe it's at least a 10-year or greater plan. It's changed to an entertainment-focused site, which I think is um, a nice synergy with, with Six Flags. 
It's a unique mix that I believe will have a regional draw um, and won't be duplicated for, for miles and miles. Um, and I do agree, there are issues that are going to have to be resolved as we move forward. And I think with our public-public uh, partnership with uh, the county, we, we can get there. Thank you. Next question for you, Mr. Magapo. Does Vallejo have a disproportionate amount of affordable housing? In your opinion, does Vallejo have a disproportionate amount of affordable housing and parolees compared to other Bay Area cities? And if this was entirely up to you, what would you do to make sure Vallejo is treated fairly? I, you know, I think uh, most housing developers have taken into account affordable housing. Uh, there's hardly any development in our city that uh, you would not find uh, a piece of that uh, development dedicated to affordable housing. Um, but with the limited t amount of time I have, I think we've seen enough housing. Uh, uh, the council had voted on housing, housing, housing. We need to focus on business. We need to stimulate the economy. We need investors to come to our city, big and small. Small investors are the, the, uh, the heart of our economy. They're our largest employer collectively. And uh, uh, we also need big employers that will bring thousands of jobs to our city. Housing is one thing. We've had plenty of that over the years. Uh, it's time to refocus and think about the economy and think about jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you. Mr. McConnell. For the eight years I sat on the Planning Commission, every single year the Vallejo Housing Authority came in and told us that we had to meet our Pachango low house costing. We finally have done that. And the nice thing about affordable housing is it's a recommendation. There's no teeth in the law, which means that we can say no. That's done through zoning. And if they want to take us to court, my position is let them. Mr. Sampayan. There were two parts to your question. Could you repeat that, please, sir? In your opinion, does Vallejo have a disproportionate amount of affordable housing and parolees compared to other Bay Area cities? And if this was entirely up to you, what would you do to make sure Vallejo is treated fairly? Thank you very much. Yes, we do have enough affordable housing. I would agree with Mr. McConnell that we have reached our limit. We have now are at the point where affordable housing has stopped. The voucher list is currently filled. They are not taking any more vouchers for affordable housing or Section 8. Regarding the parolees, I'm sad to say that because of the release of overcrowding from our prison system, we are gonna see more parolees on the street, but fortunately these are going to be low risk people that will be monitored, that will be, a, that will be watched by the parole department. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw. I think that we should fulfill the terms of the Bachango settlement and then stop. No more affordable housing. In fact, I don't think we should build any more housing from scratch. We've got plenty of empty houses here right now. I think we need to concentrate on businesses and services and improving the schools first. And concerning the parolees, this city is and always has been a dump. A couple of the zip codes in this city have more registered sex offended offenders than combinations of cities. We need to put our foot down and not have any more of that come here. Thank you. Mr. Logan? Uh, yes, we do have a disproportionate uh, amount of uh, affordable housing, um, and I work over Marin, and there are tons of affordable housing advocates saying that they don't have enough, and it's true. I've seen the numbers. Uh, the same is the case in Napa, uh, but I think we have to be strategic about how we uh, address this issue. There's an allocation that the state uh, hands down to all cities and counties that requires them to afford uh, to plan for housing in general and affordable housing uh, specifically. Uh, and so we need to be really involved in that process to make sure that we uh, are attacking this issue in a smart way. Thank you. Councilmember Hennigan? Yeah, um, I do believe we have a disproportionate share of affordable housing here in the community. And we have that housing which we can control, and then there's the affordable housing which kind of falls under the radar. And that's the, um, the, the our new foreclosures. You know, they've been purchased by people at a very low rate, they're throwing in tenants at a very low rate, and they are becoming affordable housing that is not covered by Section 8 nor through HUD programs. We need as a, as a city to do a better job at holding property owners accountable and responsible for maintaining their properties. Thank you. Mr. Esasami. Vallejo Housing Plant need a new dimensions. 
like those who their home were foreclosed. You don't need to send them out of the home. What you need to do is work a plan with them so that they'll be able to pay for their house. But a lot of people who have money job bought the house up. Give them at a high rent. If you compare with the house rent in Vallejo with that of Antioch, better home in Antioch is cheaper than even the worst house in Vallejo, which is more expensive. We need a plan that to make sure those homes that foreclose are being given back to the owner who at a lower rate. Thank you. Mr. McConnell, next question. What would you as an elected official do to help satisfy the concerns of the citizens in Vallejo about the increase in crime in Vallejo, and how? We've had many, many neighborhood watch groups grow because of the perceived threat of crime, and I believe that is the number one defense. We can also attempt to find some community block grants, and with those community block grants, we can make them available to homeowners to, number one, install alarm systems, number two, put, put in proper lighting, landscaping, encourage the use of good dogs. Uh, we, also need, we also need to think about how we're going to get more people involved. And for, I believe out of the neighborhood watch group, we're going to see the leaders of Vallejo develop tomorrow through official neighborhood associations. Because if we don't train these people for the next five years, we will hit the ground five years after we get out of Chapter 9 with no plans in place. So I'm looking to the people who have become involved in the neighborhood watch associations to go a step further form neighborhood associations and start having a leadership voice and role with the city government. Thank you. Mr. Sampion? I would agree that one of the things that we need to do is have more neighborhood watch programs within our community. Right now we have over 300 neighborhood watch programs within the city with over 3,000 residents involved. They have, in essence, captured burglars that have been plaguing some of our neighborhoods. The over 13 burglars have been arrested over the past year just because of neighborhood watch programs. Another thing that we need to think about doing is having more patrols and we can use our reserve force for that. We can use the cadets. We can bring out our CSOs that will free up our regular officers for <clears throat> random and proactive patrols. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw. I think people who are going to potentially commit crime here whether it be from an infraction level up to a felony, need to know how we're going to tolerate or not going to tolerate that. And right now, there's so many quality of life level crimes here that we don't enforce, from noise to loitering, to things that contribute to a negative image this city has, so that when you drive down Sonoma Boulevard, if you're on your way somewhere else, you're thinking, I don't ever want to come back. Thank you. We need to send a no tolerance tone out and enforce the laws. Thank you. Mr. Logan? Uh, I would say that we, we do need to look at how we restructure the police department to be more effective. Uh, in the event that Measure B does not pass, uh, this is going to be most important. And again, we have to look at how we manage crime. We need to really analyze where are certain crimes happening and find out why, is, why are those crimes occurring. Uh, and then make the decisions to get uh, police to those areas. Uh, in addition to that, we need to uh, not dwell on the, the negative. The public needs to know when crimes occur, but uh, we don't need to be on Channel 2 News about being a crime-ridden city. It hurts our image. Thank you. Michael, can I ask you to repeat the question? Sure. What would you, as an elected official in the city of Vallejo, do to help satisfy the concerns of the citizens of Vallejo about the increase in crime in Vallejo, and how? Yeah, I, you know, I agree with what's been said up here. I, being a community member, owning my home here for over 20 years, um, it's, been, it's, it's an important thing as a member of your community is to know your neighbors. Know your neighbors, know their patterns, have their phone numbers, stay in touch. Report all crimes that occur. I, th I think the increase in patrols is, is a great idea. Graffiti cleanup, you know, that, that the uh, work that Council Member Gomes has been doing with graffiti cleanup has been extremely helpful. And I also think um, we need to continue to hold property owners responsible for the crimes that occur at their properties. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Assembly. We need to build relationship between the police and the public. Very, very important. Nobody loves to commit crime. One, most of the crime committed are about those who never been to school. We need to have a workforce initiative. 
a school to work programs that will stop them for, for committing crime. Drugs need to stop because those are the things that lead to crime. We need to have cre uh, task credit, give it to some people who initiate a job. Thank you. With Mr. Magaba. You know, I, I, uh, if we want to get real, I, I feel that our police force is cut too deep. Yeah, we can go to our citizens, we can ask for volunteers, we can promote citizen police programs, neighborhood watches, fighting back, you name it. The bottom line is we cut our police force by 47%. That is an enormous number. And this is why our policing is substandard. Uh, you can equip our police force with uh, patrol cars, cameras, high-tech equipment, and be creative. Thank you. Okay, this will be the final question, and each candidate's gonna have four minutes to respond to this. And this is your closing. Mr. Sampayan, we'll start with you. What leadership qualities do you possess to create a cohesive city council working together for the good of all of Vallejo? One of the first things is being able to listen to the community. I'm a listener. I've been a police officer for over 35 years. And in my career, one of the first things I learned to do was listen. Listen to what people had to tell you. If you don't understand what people are saying, you've lost, you've lost everything. You've lost the battle. In my last assignment, I was a commander and a supervisor of Central Community Substation in downtown Vallejo. Unfortunately, it's since closed. Currently, I am the uh, crime prevention coordinator for Fighting Back Partnership. One of my jobs is being out in the community, working with a diverse population of people and listening to what's going on. One of the things that I try to do with our community is bring about short and long-term solutions to issues that are happening within neighborhoods. I believe that I have that ability and skill to do that as a city council member. Why am I running for city council? Well, Vallejo is a city in transition, folks. We have to have a cohesive city council to bring about the positive change that we need as a community. I truly believe in fiscal stability, economic development, and revitalization. Our educational system needs reform, as we all know and have all said, and we need to concern ourselves very, very much with public safety. Four minutes is not enough for me to talk to you about what I believe in the most and where we need to go as a community. Without a cohesive city council, without people that believe in financial stability, this city will be in the doldrums for the next millennium. We need to come together. We need to, to tighten up our budget. We need to be a cohesive city that believes in everyone and its community. We are very vibrant. We're very diverse. And we, as a community, feel that we can come together and do the right things for Vallejo. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kershaw? <clears throat> I believe in order to be a leader, you have to lead from your heart as well as your mind. And you have to be motivated out of the love for what you do, not the money for what you get. I'm taking absolutely no money for my campaign, and, if, and when I'm elected, which I'm sure I will be, I'm not gonna take, I'm not gonna take any pay. I'll do it for free. I'm an average citizen. I'm at the grassroots level. I feel that that's where government begins. I, I, um, I am an innovative person. I'm a creative person. I'm unconventional, I have a great imagination and a big mouth. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Logan. I agree, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I've never spoken for four minutes uh, straight in my life, so this will probably be about two minutes and then uh, Aaron, you can have the balance of my time. Um, <laughs> oh, no, that wasn't a shot, though. <laughs> Only if you want it. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's great to see all you out um, uh, to listen to our ideas for how we make Vallejo a better place. We all love Vallejo. Uh, we all call it home. Uh, we do business in the city. Uh, and so I think this is the start of how we actually get to rebuilding our city. 
And, and I'm excited about the opportunity to, number one, be running as a candidate and to uh, uh, potentially be on the city council. Um, I just want to say a couple things about my, uh, my leadership style. Uh, currently, I lead a, a public organization, which means I'm always interfacing with the community. I report to a five-member uh, publicly elected board of directors. Uh, and so in that job, as you could imagine, I deal with uh, tons of different personalities. Uh, but my style is to always treat folks with dignity and respect. I think that's key to uh, building the type of working relationships that uh, will build the city and, and build, rebuild the city and push the city forward. Uh, it's important that we have folks on the council that know how these things work. Uh, it's great to have grandiose plans, but unless you actually know how it works, uh, it's hard for you to make those types of decisions. I know how, to, how it works and I know how to do it. Um, the, the last thing that I just kind of want to talk about is uh, uh, that Vallejo's history is, is great. Uh, our recent past has been uh, somewhat troubling, uh, but I think that we have brighter days ahead of us. Uh, the potential that we have is only potential unless we realize it. Uh, so the reason why I'm running for city council is because I think we can do it. I'm going to work with all stakeholders to make sure that we're putting forth the best vision forward. And I look forward to hearing uh, more your your concerns with the city, uh, incorporating your ideas into my plan, my strategy uh, for how we move the city forward. I want to thank you again for coming out. My name is John Logan, and I'm running for the Vallejo City Council, and I would appreciate your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. I think you were close to four minutes. I thought that was nicely done. <laughs> You're throwing me for a loop here, but that's okay. Um, probably the best quality I bring to the city of Vallejo as a, as a council member is that I do listen, and I listen to everybody. I listen to every side of every angle in order to bring a balanced approach to decision making. I'm not 100% one way or 0% the other. I try and work with my council member, my fellow council members and the mayor to get to a point where we can make decisions so we can continue to move forward because that's what we need to do. This is a beautiful community. We all are here tonight because we love our town and we're concerned about the direction that we've been going. And with um, the emergence from bankruptcy, we have an excellent opportunity to really take our town to the best that it can be. We have an excellent location. We have wonderful weather. We've got so many positive things going on here. We've got Turo and CMA and Solano Community College. We have our lovely waterfront. We've got um, all the open space, all the potential development. We've talked about it tonight. Solano 360, the north end of Mare Island. A lot, a lot of bright spots here in our city. Um, and I, you know, I do have to say though, in this position over the last four years, we haven't always agreed, but I wouldn't expect us to agree, but I would respect that we would hold each other um, accountable for our decisions and that we would be respectful of those decisions and at the end of the day, know that we're making these decisions because we believe it's what's best for our community. Um, my, my leadership style is more hands-off. Um, I like to prepare for, for my meetings. I like to talk to different groups around the issues so I can get a good idea about what's, what's coming up so I can make the best decision possible. Um, I don't like to micromanage. You don't see me a lot at City Hall. I'll call every once in a while to get some answers to questions that I may have because I really want to hold the, city, the people at City Hall, I want them to be able to have the time to do the job that they need to do. It's a tough job and they're working more with less and I appreciate that. And if it wasn't for my fellow council members, I certainly would not have been able to get done what I've, had, what I've gotten done in the last four years and that is to work with the chronic nuisance ordinance. It hasn't been ratified yet, but it's already resulted in a 50% reduction in crime in some of our most crime-ridden properties. Um, I'm working to make Vallejo a good steward of the environment. I've got two ordinances in the hopper where we're looking at uh, reducing news racks on the waterfront so we can stop polluting our waterways. 
Um, I've saved the city millions of dollars, and if it wasn't for my fellow council members in approving it, in, in reducing our truck routes in the city of Vallejo, taking those big semis off of our city streets and putting them on the highways that surround us and bisect our city where they belong, so we don't have to pay for the maintenance of it through our general fund. Those are the types of solutions that I'm looking for. I support um, our quality of life issues, I support public safety, and I support education for all of our children. There are kids, we need to support them too. I can't tell you what the future is going to hold, but I can only tell you that I'm going to take the, the how I've acted, how I've made decisions from the last four years into the next four years, and this town is going to be a better town. And I think tonight you've got some excellent candidates to choose from. My name is Erin Hannigan. My work is not done. I'm asking for your vote to put me back onto the city council for the next four years. Thank you. Mr. Asomeme? My name is uh, Matea Sesomeme. I moved from Oakland to Vallejo. Compared with the crime in the city of Oakland, I feel Vallejo is more safer to the time I came. But right now, it's not the, the same story. When I'm running for the city council member, I'm a man of integrity, with vision, ready to listen, determinations, always positive in thinking. I never think of negative. Because I believe when we work together as a team, we can move the mountain. Um, and like in the city, in our city here, there's a lot of crime. How do you tackle those problems? Going to the grassroots of those problems. That's how we tackle those problems. Those who are not at job, we give them job. Those who, who commit crime. I know people say, in prison, those people that commit crime is more beneficial. No. We can work things out to those who commit crime. I, I'm running for the council member because one, I'm a mentor, married counselor, and a preacher also. I would love to create a job that, added, that accelerate in just our growth in our city by initiation. If I say I want to create a job, I don't have a million to create a job. Those who have the money, sitting on pool of money, refuse to create that job. But we initiate an idea that they can create a job. It's very important. Many people have lost their home in this city. We need to have a guideline that can stop people from losing their homes. If you have a guideline in our city, nobody can foreclose anybody's home. In our education, as can standard, the school is good, but the standard of education is deteriorating. I have four children who graduated from Vallejo High School with good grades. But what can we do? We need a, a good initiation. The dress code, some of them, we see the way they dress in the school. It's nothing to write about. You have children taking iPod to school. So if you have a wife, they listen to music in the school. Instead of reading, the teacher, maybe some of the child is afraid to ask them, why are you listening to the music? The father should know. The education of the children is not only the teacher, but both including the families. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Malgapo. My name is uh, Jesus Malgapo. I serve our country for 25 years, honorably, and I'm proud of it. Uh, I started out as an enlisted man for the first five years. I uh, had an opportunity to get a commission, and the last 20 years of my military service was as a naval officer, where I was engaged in uh, uh, financial management, logistics management, inventory management, and uh, uh, working within the uh, infrastructure of the military uh, globally. Uh, very much enjoyed that career uh, until my retirement, where I joined private industry. Uh, I'm a project accountant for a construction company so I understand development, I understand construction, I understand prevailing wages, I understand uh, e ERIs and so forth. Uh, so I have a good mix of uh, military uh, experience where I've proven my leadership abilities. I've also proven my ability to work with people. In our city, 
you see, uh, if you watch council proceedings, uh, many times it's a split vote, five, two, four, three, but that's the beauty of democracy. Our system of government is one of constituency. We don't, we can't have 120,000 people converge on the dais. First, it's not big enough. Second, you'll never get a consensus. That's why you elect council members. And I'm <coughs> coming to you tonight asking for your support. If you're gonna vote by mail <coughs> on October 10th, please select me as your choice. If you like going to the polls, that will be on November 8, uh, 2011. Uh, please vote for me as well. Uh, remember, it's about jobs and it's about our schools. They go hand in hand. Our city is in very good position right now. We're about to exit. We've exited Chapter 9 and we're doing well. We have a budget that there are no cuts, no layoffs, no deferrals. That's phenomenal. Uh, however, there's not a lot of wiggle room. I mentioned to you earlier there's a lot of work to be done when we come to the execution phase of that uh, budget. Our school system, which is, our umbilical cords are connected, believe me. Uh, no one will come to our city as long as our, our schools are bad. Families will continue to leave our city as long as our school systems are bad. They're connected. But look at the Vallejo School District. They're now in position where they're talking about possibly getting out of receivership so the city is healing, the school system is healing, we're in great position, and I think I have something to contribute if you put me in the city council. Um, thank you, and we, we, as the city begins to heal financially, economically, we could also heal as a city and become brothers and sisters again. Okay, so we, we disagree. We vote 4-3 or 5-2, but at the end of the day, that, one, that council is one council. Remember, they, the incumbent council, and we, we don't thank them enough, let me tell you, they work night and day to get us out of chapter nine. They roll their sleeves, and I, I give them kudos. Thank you very much for bringing us to where we are today. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. McConnell. Yes, on behalf of all of us here, we want to extend our appreciation for your organizing of this, conducting of it, and especially for you in the audience who have come to listen to us. I know for many, many years I've been out there, and for the first time I find myself up here. So what I'd like to do is explain why I'm running, what qualities I think I can bring to the council. I think the qualities that I have are unique, and it's based upon a combination of education, experience, employment, and judgment. I suppose most of you know I've been a, an attorney for many decades. I actually started out to be a city manager. I did my undergraduate work in public administration at San Jose State. I was writing my master's thesis on the right of the public employee to strike when the Army decided they needed me more. That strike did take place three years later here in Vallejo. So I'm aware of the labor relations that have existed in this town for almost a half of a century. Throughout my career, I have worked both in public jobs, I've worked in private industry, I own and operate my own business, and I have for years. I have a rare combination of having worked from everything as a, from a pear picker, which people tell me I shouldn't mention, but it's honest hard work, through fighting forest fires, being a deputy district attorney, being a United States clerk, a law clerk for the United States Court of Appeals in San Francisco. I've worked at the, for the uh, State Personnel Board. I've worked for the federal government. I've done just about everything imaginable in and outside of government. At the uh, Personnel Board, we did nothing but run wages and compensation and standards analysis in order to recommend to the state what wages and compensation and standards, they're all different, should be paid to employees. I had the honor of becoming a government intern coordinator, where my job was to recruit students into government service for the state of California. It was during the time that Reagan was doing his economic reforms in the state of California, and I learned how to take money out of a budget where none existed by going to the Reagan super cabinet and convince them of the worthwhileness of the process involved. I've lobbied on behalf of consumers in Washington, D.C., I've represented thousands of people in, in litigation, ranging from antitrust cases all the way through zoning cases. I understand government. 
I've had experience on the Planning Commission, including as chair for eight years, on the Vallejo Charter Review Committee, where we recommended a number of proposals for changes in this city that have never seen the light of day by the City Council, except for Measure A, and also on the City Manager's Budget Review Committee. I speak legalese, I speak bureaucrat, and I speak bankruptcy. And I can tell you that there are hooks involved in that Chapter 9 plan where if we do not watch how we spend our money, we do run the exposure of being brought back in. And one of the things I am is a very strong financial conservative person. I don't like to spend money, I don't like to spend it foolishly, and I watch budgets. I've also had the experience of working in personnel, so I understand the civil issues as well. And I believe that that has all brought a lot of experience. One of the things that I especially learned while I was a combat rifleman in Vietnam in the rice paddies was that nothing else matters except life and death. Everything else pretty well pales in comparison. And when we're talking about wages, compensation, and standards, and potholes, we have to keep that in mind because it does all affect the quality of life. I live here, I work here, I'm invested here, I'm not going anywhere. I believe that I can help turn this city around. One of the particular, the, the unique qualities I have is being a mediator. I've been trained by the American Arbitration Association, an arbitrator, mediator, and also a litigator. And I can bring uniformity to the council because I listen and I articulate well on what I believe. Thank Again, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to once again thank all of you candidates for taking the time to come out tonight. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank you for your willingness to serve the citizens of Vallejo. That is very much appreciated. Um, this concludes the council portion. This concludes the council's portion. We're going to take about a 15-minute break, and then we will have the mayoral forum. So I, there's water, and uh, you can stretch your legs out there. Thank you. <laughs>